Well, we got this 2012 Malibu. But you know, I have this pesty check engine light on. I hate those check engine lights. It could be anything from an O2 sensor all the way up to maybe a massive problem. We don't know, but we're gonna diagnose it and fix it today on Tech Garage. Welcome to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Well, we're in our newly revamped shop and I have to tell you, it's looking better than ever. And I'm back with Brian. Now I'm John Gardner, this is Brian Gregory. He's a DIY car guy extraordinaire. Brian, you're looking better than ever too, but you know what, what about the shop? It looks fantastic, John. We got parts flowing fast and furiously from rockauto.com. We've got some new tools from Snap-on. We're ready to tackle any project we want to this year. And speaking of that, you know, we have Project M&M. Could be a Maserati, it may be a Mercury but I'll give you a hint, it's doable. We'll be able to transfer those skills right out in your own driveway. We also have the video question of the week. This is cool because we have an actual video question with a real problem that everybody encounters every single day. Love that. You know what, all year long, you guys reached out to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter with great questions. So we decided to put you on the air to answer some of those questions for you this year. Well, enough of that. You know, one thing we're not at Tech Garage and that's fluff. So let's dive right into our Malibu. Brian, we got a code P0010. Zero. Man, that's a variable valve timing issue. I mean, map sensors, throttle position sensors, O2 sensors, easy to tackle. This one, not so much. You know, this can be an intimidating repair right out of the gate. You get the check engine light. We've all done that. We've talked about proper diagnostics. This could be a scary one, but we're gonna simplify it for you and show you exactly how this whole variable valve thing actually works. And it's a whole lot better than the old school way of adjusting timing, John. Yeah, well, let me see this. Is this actually points? Brian, you're really giving away your age here. <laughs> yeah, I certainly am. Back in the day, you wanted to adjust your timing at 70 miles an hour. You send somebody out under the hood to adjust this thing. Modern day variable valve timing, you don't have to do that. So we're gonna get to it. Now, as complex as it sounds, true tech garage fashion, we're gonna simplify it for you. So I got a demo set up that's gonna show you how the variable valve timing works, but you always need to start with a good visual inspection. You'll tackle that, I'll get the demo set up. Awesome, now he's got that fancy wireless scan tool, which I love, but for most of us working in the driveway, we've got a scan code reader like this from Rock Auto. I validated the code, so we are in fact gonna go into that variable valve solenoid on the intake side, 0010, that's your clue. So, get this out of the way. As we do with any project in Tech Garage, the first step is a really good visual inspection. You're looking for anything obvious that's either a contributing factor to the problem or a primary factor to the problem. So we've located the variable valve solenoids. They're right here at the top. There's overhead cams, intake, and exhaust side. So the first thing you want to do is get your light and look down in here. Now, John's going to show you how they work. It's awesome how it works, but they're oil actuated. So we're looking for any obvious oil leaks down around the housing here. I don't see any. So the next step is let's pull the connector. It's not brittle, nothing's broken. And we want to get a good look at the terminals down in here and check and make sure the copper's good, nothing's bent over. Same thing down on the top of the solenoid valve itself. Nothing obvious there. So I'm gonna button this back up. We don't want any contamination to get down in there. And then you want to follow the wiring path and look again for any obvious damage. There's nothing that looks like it's a problem here, at least to the naked eye. Now, keep in mind, oil actuated, so the next step is to check the oil. We happen to know the history of this vehicle, and the oil's been changed pretty regularly. No tarring, no sludge, no real issues, we don't think, but you've gotta have the right viscosity and the right flow and the right oil pressure to make this variable valve solenoid work. John, I'll show you how. So, I'm just gonna do a quick check here of the oil. Check it. Yep, we're good. Good clean oil, nothing obvious there. Now, for a lot of people, you might go to get a service manual page online, follow the diagnostic procedure to a T. That's great, and you can do that, but it's complex and it's a little bit tedious. I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna use this for validation, but I'm gonna show you how to do it in the driveway. You're gonna be amazed how much easier this is, but John's gonna show you how this whole system really works. 
variable valve timing. What is it? How does it actually work? Well, it actually optimizes performance by moving the camshaft and it affects timing like Brian said earlier. How does it work? Well, you have a computer on your car and what it does, it looks at inputs, all these disparate sensors, camshaft, crankshaft, engine load. These are called enable criteria. When it hits some given points, it actually allows it through the cam position actuator solenoid, that oil to flow he was talking about earlier. Once it flows through, it's gonna move that actual phaser and I can show it to you right here in action. This is pretty cool because here's an actual graphic and an illustration of it working. So what's happening is it actually starts to go here and when it goes, you can see the camshaft's actually moving and the timing chain is not. So that allows the valves to open at different times. Here it is on our engine right here. If you look at the front of the engine, what you have is that you have a variable valve timing system. You have a camshaft position sensor that knows where it's located, that's right here. And then Brian was checking out this actual solenoid right here. This is the actual solenoid. Now the solenoid allows that oil to inject into the system. So those two components allow this phaser to move back and forth. Once again, it's watching it, it's looking at these positions where it's at, it's moving back and forth with oil injection through the cover, through the center, and it's moving that camshaft. Now here it is in action, this is really cool, because I have one out of a car, and if I take the front of this off, I'm gonna show you how it works. And you can actually see the little veins and the wipers in here, and you can see what it's doing. Now like I said, to optimize performance and also EGR, exhaust gas recirculation, we can keep some of that in cylinder by affecting the timing and lower those temperatures. Temperatures. But check this out, if I hold the timing and I actually move this to the left or the right, the camshaft's moving, but see, the timing's not. The timing chain stays the same. So if it injects oil on this side, it's gonna wanna push it in this direction. If it injects oil on the other side, it puts it in that direction. So what is it doing? Once again, optimal performance, optimal timing, but oil's key there. But I'll tell you what, there's plenty more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Stick around, we'll be right back. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by Woodward Fab, selling quality metalworking equipment since 1966. Evapo Rust, super safe rust remover. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Well, welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, I told you this diagnostic service manual flow chart was going to be a complex test, long and tedious of sorts, and it is. That's why we pulled out the big guns, Chief Tech Chase, to help us understand a proper, accurate system test. Chase, what do we got going on here? Right, not only is it complex, you got to have a high dollar scan tool to do this <laughs> test, and not everybody has that. And what I did here, Brian, is I went in and hooked up our scan tool, and what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to communicate with that actuator. And what we're going to do is we're going to stick this meter and use it as an actuator, basically. Okay. If you go ahead and hook us up to that pin right there, I'll run a test. Okay. And now what this test is going to do is just tell me if, if my wiring is good or not, am I communicating. That's okay. all it's going to tell me to do. So to get this part of the test right, we had to hit the A post here. The diagram online told us that. We put a needle down in this A post and we're good. And I'm connected. So let's see what we got. All right. We should have, we got some voltage there. And what I'm going to do when I actuate this, that voltage should go away. And that tells me we're communicating. Perfect. All right. We'll go ahead and continue here and run the test. Great. And there you see it. As you can tell, now that tells us the whole system is good. We, we might want to start looking at the component. Okay, really important to understand. So you can do this fancy test at home for sure, but for us car guys who need a better way and don't have all the fancy tools, John's going to show us exactly how we do this in the driveway and still get the accuracy. Yeah, and you don't have to be a ninja with the scan tool like Chief Tech Chase here. All right, thank you. Hey, listen up. This is a component test. Now you can use a component test on any one of these circuits, which is really cool because we're just testing the component. You can do this right on the driveway. And injectors, coils, any kind of solenoids, they have an ohmic value. So if I slip, slip this over to ohms of resistance and I give you the lead here and we switch them over, Brian, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go across that actual component, terminals A and B down at the component itself. Yep. And what we're trying to see is an ohmic value and this thing actually says anywhere from 9.5 to 15 on the graphic so we know what it is and ours is showing OL, that's infinity, that's it's out of limits, out of that's limits. gone. So yeah. that's a good thing because if it wasn't that, we'd be digging down in that cam solenoid and down to the actual actuator, we don't wanna do that. So what we can do here is go ahead and pull that out and I'll show you the test that we actually ran. It's called ohmic values or testing actually for resistance. Now, I have one here and I actually blew it apart for us. This is cool because this is what Brian's taken out. We took it over to the big old chop saw and we took it apart. So what's happening inside of any solenoid 
is the actual voltage is coming in, it's going around here and it's creating a magnetic field which is either pulling or pushing that solenoid open and closed which is actually injecting that oil into that cam phaser and that's what's making it happen there. So you can see if any one of these are broken, the wires are broken, when we go across that with that ohmic value it was OL or out of limits. Well, the meter sends out a little signal and it didn't see anything come back so infinity and beyond, it's gone. So it actually read OL. Now you can have these wires actually shorted to each other. If they're touching each other, it's gonna bypass all this resistance. You're gonna get this super high number on there, which is bad. It's not falling within that specifications. Now I got a couple different sensors you can look at. We have an actual injector here. Now my injector is a fuel injector. Same thing, it's got a wire windings in there. It's gonna have an ohmic value. So if I switch my meter over here to ohms, you can see here on ohms, and I go across the actual solenoid itself, you can see this injector showing 16.3. Well, in the factory service manual, you'll have a spec, or you can look it up and you'll see if it's good or bad right there, but it's not OL, so we know we're in better shape. Now also, you have wheel speed sensors, same thing. There's a wire winding. It's picking up a signal, a magnetically induced signal from a wheel speed sensor. So if I go across this guy here, this wheel speed sensor, Man, that thing's got about 300 and something there. That's a good one, 341. I don't know what the spec is, but we would look it up and we can tell if that was good or bad. Coils, once again, the same thing. Coils have big winding of wires in there. Primary side inducing it to the secondary side. Has to have an ohmic value or ohms of resistance. Now here's the new solenoid we're gonna replace it with. Now you remember that flow chart? It said 9.5 and a little bit higher to that. I think it went all the way up to, let me take a look at it again. 9.5 to 15 ohms of resistance. It has to fall within that window. Well, I got the new solenoid. I'm gonna put one on each terminal here. And I have 10.5, man, that's right down the middle of the road. This solenoid's in good shape. Brian, I got your rockauto.com solenoid ready to go. How are you doing? Awesome, I have this old one just about out. Now, here's a really good tip, this is important. You're working on the top of any engine, overhead camshaft, you don't want any chance of something falling down in there. So I like to use a magnet here to get our one 10 millimeter bolt up out, there it is. We're gonna put it up here out of harm's way. I'm gonna go ahead and work this solenoid up out. It comes right out. There you go, John, I'll hand you that. And again, really important to clean this deck, clean this area right here so nothing falls down into the valve train or on those cam lobes. There we go. Okay, we're ready for your new one, buddy. Yep, and you can match them up. Make sure they're gonna be right. About the right depth there, it's pretty cool. And what I really like about this solenoid, check it out, even comes with the bolt. So if oh, you didn't drop it into perfect. the engine, it just fell down the engine compartment, and you're still good to go. All right, I'm gonna get it torqued. We'll get it reconnected, and I think we're ready for a road test. Yep, and check this out right here. These are the little screens right here. That's what Brian was talking about, the oil flow. This has to be clean, everything has to go in there. Now it's just a matter of getting that torque down the specifications, reconnecting everything, double check your work, and obviously clear the codes, take it on a test drive, let it run that enable criteria we talked about a little bit earlier, bam, it'll run that test, you'll have variable valve time, and this thing will be running great, top notch. But I'll tell you what, there's plenty more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Stick around, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Now I'm super excited to introduce a segment called Project M&M. &M. And I know what you're thinking, where's the cool retro mod? Where's the cool classic car or even a good looking race car? No, not here at Tech Garage. We're gonna bring you the stuff that you can use right out in the driveway. And what a better platform to use than Project M&M, &M, which is Mercury Makeover. Tom, great car and also great story. Tell me about it. Yeah, when I shop for a used car, I, I shop the history and the, the previous owner as much as I do the car almost. And, and th this car is a great history. It was owned by one family, they bought it new, and then the uh, younger generation inherited it, and, and it sat for a couple of years. They didn't have a need for it. So yeah, I know where it came from. I, I believe the miles has just about 50,000 miles. It's a southern car, so there's no rust. Uh, I'm real optimistic about it being a, a somebody can turn it, use it as a daily driver for another 100,000 miles or more. Yeah, or 200,000, great platform. Now I took it on a test drive, Tom, and what I found is first off, I noticed the check engine lights on. I mean, that could be a number of things. Yeah, the sit in a couple of years, it could be something, just bad gas, a loose gas cap even, I'll be optimistic. Yeah, I hope so. Also the brakes, you know, when I go to push the brakes, I got this pedal pulsation, lateral run out, there's cool technical terms for it, but you know, we'll go through the brakes as well. 
Sure. Yeah, 50,000 miles is 50,000 miles, so it might need new brakes. Yep. Never want. Steering pull. I mean, steering wheel's pulling to the right. That could be an alignment issue, but, I mean, you took a walk around this car a little earlier. What about the tires? It's got one good tire. <laughs> Most of the other, the other three, there's cracks and, and splits that look like tread from a distance, but they're not tread. Yeah, <laughs> they're, exactly. They're, that they're could pops. attribute to the actual pull. Shocks bouncing like a baby buggy, man. I mean, I know they're supposed to ride nice, but not float all over the road. Shocks have a lifespan as well. Yeah, original equipment shocks, you should replace them at 50,000 miles anyways, which is right where this car is at. Right, and it also was running a little rough. Now that could take some engine diagnostics. We could have some issues with that. The body, what do you think about the body? You took a walk around the car. Yeah, yeah I'm excited. Southern car, there's a little road rash on one side. The previous owner, I guess, hit one of those orange traffic barrels. Um, but white paint's easy to match, and uh, I think we can get it looking like new again. Replace these fogged over headlamp assemblies. It'll be looking nice. Yeah, there's not much to do on the outside. Now, this is really a reliable car, and it's really cool for our viewers, Tom, because, I mean, we got a, we got a V8, we got a rear-wheel drive, we got a differential, we got struts, we got coilovers, we got all kinds of cool stuff on here that we can work on throughout. And, you know, it's going to be cost-effective to even work on this car. These are police packages, taxis. They're pretty durable. Right, and you got room for six, huge trunk. It's a great car to work on. We have a, a tool on rockauto.com. You can actually compare the cost of replacement parts for two vehicles. We kind of know this vehicle, but if you don't know them as well, I can show you how that works so we can see, hey, let's compare this car to other cars we might be considering in the same size or, or price range. And that's perfect. That's what we need to do. We also need to do an evaluation of the undercarriage as well. We'll do that maybe in a come show coming up. But let's go ahead and head over to the bench. You know, we got the computer set up where we can go to rockauto.com and we can actually do that cost analysis from the cars. Let's head over. Great. Well, Tom, we did our evaluation. I mean, we know what we're up against, but you got this repair index calculator. How does this thing work? Well, we, we have parts for all these different vehicles. And we said, hey, let's create a tool where we can compare basket of parts for this car with a basket of parts for this car and, and see what the, how the costs compare. How much will it cost to fix this car now and maintain it over the long term? So let me show you how it works. And that's huge. I mean, we're dealing with the marquee. It's a pretty common car. You know, we saw it with the police line and the other ones too, the taxi cabs, you know, basic car. Yeah, well, well we have two columns, one for the, each of the two cars you're comparing. So we'll pull up the 2006 Mercury Grand Marquis so that's their first car, and maybe if you if you like Fords and, and you're wondering about a uh, maybe a 2006 Lincoln. There you go. So we'll pull 2006 Lincoln. Maybe look at the LS. So this one engine came in that. Check those off, and now we uh, view part cost comparison. Wow. So what it's done here on the left we have the Lincoln LS, and the right we have the Mercury Marquis, and there's different. Uh, the, the different color, colors represent different systems on the vehicle, okay. heat and air conditioning, exhaust emissions. So, so we can see the uh, cooling system for the, the Lincoln costs quite a bit more than it does for the, the Mercury. And, and overall, the, the, it'll cost a lot, may cost a lot more to repair the Lincoln over the long haul than it will the Mercury. 1.7 times as much to repair the Lincoln as it does the Mercury. And you know, that could be because the Lincoln LS, they made less of them. Um, so, so there's less, less parts choice, l less parts available. It's, it's a luxury car, so systems may be more expensive. But, but you're often surprised by, uh, like the, I remember the, the little uh, low-cost Metro, Geo Metro, has some pretty expensive systems on it. Sure. So th this is a good tool to use for whatever two cars you're comparing. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, we can go Ford, Chevrolet, we can go against anything. So if I'm going to go out there and shop, it's a great thing to look at because, you know, we know what we're dealing with. We got a kind of a run of the mill car. We know the cost comparison. We know we're going to do it economically and we're going to do it well. So very cool tool. That's awesome. I'll tell you what, stick around because there's plenty more at Tech Garage when we return right after this break. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by Custom Auto Sound, the originator of classic car OEM fit radio since 1977. Clamp Tight, the clamp making tool. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, we're to the video question segment, which I love, Brian, because this is a real problem. Let's check it out. Hey, guys, I got a question for you. Take a listen to this. It's been doing that for a while, but it told me to replace the engine, but it's hard to do that going through college. What else can I check? Kyle, Kyle, Kyle. It's not looking good, not sounding good, buddy. 
No, I'm not digging that one. <laughs> Heavy knocks, not good. But anyway, let's talk about bearings. Brian, I got a couple bearings right here on the table. Yeah, now here's a main bearing. So this is where the bottom of the piston and connecting rod marries up to the crankshaft. Here's an extremely worn bearing that absolutely could be making that sound. Absolutely, and this is actually what it's supposed to look like. This is actually a brand new bearing. And you also have a thrust bearing that controls the crankshaft back and forth movement. Yep. You know, we'll talk about diagnosing it, but let's take let's a look at the bearing. Them. Yeah, it's right here in the engine. It's pretty simple We're to check pull out. pull a main cap here, Kyle. <laughs> Awesome. And this bearing, so you can get a look at it firsthand. Do that. I'll pop it up here. I should be able to knock it loose. There, there you go. All right. Wow. Real good catch. All right, so there it is. There's where the Baron rides, rides here. And there's also a second half under the crankshaft. Right under there's a second half. Now, this pin can come loose and they could spin in there or it could be so worn like ours, Brian. It's got to get oil. It's got to shed heat and get the lubricity that it needs. If that fails, that absolutely could cause the knocking sound that you're hearing. Yep, and you also have a main bearing, one back here, which is a thrust bearing. That's going to control the back and forth movement of the crankshaft. And, you know, you push the clutch in or you put it in gear, that changes. That now, up. there's also rod bearings. This is great because the rod bearings actually come down with the fire. When it comes down with the fire, it's hitting that crankshaft. So if we take the fire away, it's going to lessen that noise. And we got a great video that illustrates that. He's going to go from number one, you're going to hear a little change, to number two. There's really a big change. That's going to tell us the difference. Kyle, roll watch that close. Video. This is something you can do in your driveway with the right tools. So here he goes. Now he's going to number one. Listen up. And you can hear that change, but not very loud. Just a little bit, but it changed. But watch this. This is the coolest. Oh, wow. Hear that? Now he's going to go back and forth. Listen. Watch when he goes back. Bam. There There's it is. There's your problem piston right there. That's exactly what it is. It's yep. a connecting rod. It's coming down. It's smanking on that crankshaft. Bam, bam. As it smacks, it makes that noise. Yeah. Now, also remember, bearing noises, upper ends are half speed because yep. the camshaft turns half crankshaft speed and the lower ones are not. So a couple ways you can do it. Take a stethoscope. Yep. I love these. Yeah. Isolate up or down. Plus, I look like a doctor. That at least cool. gets you in the neighborhood. Absolutely. Yep. But that's a great check that anybody can do. Kyle, as for you and your truck through college, well... Drive it till it drops, buddy. Yep. <laughs> well, our uh, phasers went good today. Yeah, the variable valve timing solenoid ended up being a fun project. Scary codes at the beginning. You know, it's something, it's new technology, but I'm so glad we don't have to advance timing with vacuum or set points like the old school way. I'll tell you what, we're getting better performance in everything. Hey, make sure you check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. For now, we're out of time. So join us next week right back here at the newly revamped Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Chipola College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Chipola College has a current enrollment of over 2,000 students. Chipola was recently ranked as one of the top three community colleges in the United States. 